from Fisherman's Wharf in San Francisco. It's theCUBE, covering IBM Chief Data Officer Strategy Summit, Spring 2017. Brought to you by IBM. Hey, welcome back everybody. Jeff Frick here at theCUBE. It is lunchtime at the IBM CDO Summit. Packed house, you can see them back there getting their nutrition. But we're going to give you some mental nutrition. We're excited to be joined by a repeat performance of Courtney Abercrombie <laughs> coming on back with uh, BJ, BJ Shankar. He's the GM Cognitive IoT and Analytics for IBM. Welcome. Thanks for having me. So first off, did you eat before you came on? I want to make I sure did, you don't thank pass you. out or anything. <laughs> <laughs> Courtney and I both managed to grab a quick bite. Excellent. So let's, let's jump into it. Cognitive, a lot of buzz. IoT, a lot of buzz. How do they fit? Where do they mesh? Why, is it, why are they so important to one e another? E excellent question. IoT, IoT has been around for a long time even though we never called it IoT. Right? My favorite example is smart meters that utility companies use. So these things have been here for more than a decade. And if you, if you think about IoT, you know, there are two aspects to it. There is the instrumentation, right? Putting the sensors in and getting the data. And the insights aspect, which is making sense of what the sensor is trying to tell us. Combining these two is where the value is for the client, right? Just by putting arbitrary sensors, it doesn't make much, much sense. So, look at the world around us now, right? The traditional utility, I will stick with the utilities to, to complete the story. Utilities all get disrupted from both sides. On one hand, you have your electric vehicles plugging into the grid to draw power. On the other hand, you have supply coming from like solar roofs and so on. So optimizing this is where the cognitive and analytics kicks in. So that's the beauty of this world. All these things come together, that convergence is where the big value is. Right, because the third element that you didn't have in your original one was what's going on, you know, what, what should we do, and then actually doing something, right? Exactly. You gotta have the action yes. to pull it all together. And learning as we go, right? The, the one thing that is available today with cognitive systems that we did not have in the past was this ability to learn as you go. So you don't need human intervention to keep changing the optimization algorithms. These things can learn by itself, right, and, and improve over time, which is huge. So, but, do, but do you still need a person to help kind of figure out what you're optimizing for? I mean, that's where, can you have a pure machine-driven algorithm without knowing exactly what are you optimizing for? We are nowhere close to that today, right? So general AI, you know, where the system is like super smart by itself is, is a far away uh, concept. Right. But there are lots of aspects of specific AI, you know, optimizing a given process that can still go into this unsupervised learning aspects, but it needs boundaries. Right. System can get smart within boundaries, system cannot just replace human thought. Right? Just augmenting our intelligence. Right. Courtney, you're shaking your head over there. I'm completely in agreement. <laughs> we are nowhere near, my husband's actually looking forward to the robotic apocalypse by the way, so, uh, so <laughs> he's the opposite of me. Yeah. I, I love people, <laughs> he's like looking forward to that. He's like, the less people, the better. Yeah. You must not have a Zumba, or whatever those little vacuum cleaner things. Yeah, yeah so. Zumba. <laughs> Tell him it's the fewer people are better. <laughs> the, 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 the fewer people, the better for him. He's a finance guy, he'd rather just sit with the, you know, the money all day, but what does that say about me? Anyway, um, <laughs> not, let's really digress, but, um, yeah, no, I think we're never going to really get to that point because we always, as people, have to be training these systems to think right. like us. So exactly. we're never going to have systems that are just autonomically out there, you know, without having an intervention here and there to learn the next steps. Right. Uh, you know, that's just how it works. Well, and I always like the, the autonomous vehicle just example because it's just so clean. You know, if somebody jumps in front of the car, does the car hit the person or run into the ditch? Where Today, a person can't make that judgment very fast. They're just going to react. Yep. Right. But in computer time, that's like forever. So you can actually make rules, and then, then people go bananas. Well, what if it's a grandma on one side and kids on the other? Right. Which do you go? Or what if it's a criminal that just robbed a bank? Do you take them out on purpose? So Trade you, know, you get into a lot of, of, of interesting uh, parameters that have nothing to do necessarily with the mechanics of making that decision. Yeah, and this changes the fundamentals of computing big time too, right? Because the car cannot wait to ping the cloud to find out, you know, should I break or should I just run over, you know, this person in front of me? So it needs to make that determination right away. Very quick. Right? And hopefully the right decision, which is to break. Right. But on the other hand, all the cars that have this algorithm together have collective learning, which needs some kind of cloud computing, right? So this whole idea of edge computing 
will come and replace a lot of what exists today. So serious disruption even behind the scenes on how we architect these systems. It's yeah. a fascinating time. And then how much of the compute, the store is at the edge, how much of the compute, the store in the cloud, and then depending on the decision, yeah. like you said, can you do it locally or do you have to send it upstream exactly. or break it in pieces? I mean, if you look at a, a car of the future, forget car of the future, a car of the present like Tesla, that has more compute power than a small data center. Right? Multiple yeah. CPUs, lots of RAM, lot of hard disk. Right? It, it's a little cloud that runs on wheels. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's a little data center that runs on wheels. Yeah. Let me ask you a question. And, uh, uh, and, and here's the question. At, uh, we, we talk about systems that learn, cognitive systems that are constantly learning and we're training them. Uh, how do we ensure that Watson, for example, is constantly operating in the interest of the customer and not the interest of IBM? Now there is a reason I'm asking this question. <laughs> because at some point in time, I can foresee some other company offering up a similar set of services. Mm -hmm. I can see those services competing for attention. As we move forward with increasingly complex decisions, with increasingly complex sources of information, what does that say about how these systems are going to interact with each other? I'll, I'll He's explain. always with the loaded questions today. <laughs> no, it, it's an excellent question. It's something that I, I worry about all the time as well. Something we worry understand. about with our clients too. Sure. So, there are a couple of approaches by which this will exist, right? To begin with, while we have the big lead in, in cognitive computing now, there is no hesitation on my part to admit that the ecosystem around us is also fast developing and there will be hefty competition going forward, which is a good thing, because if you look at how this world is developing, it is developing as APIs, right? So APIs will fight on their own merits. So it's a very pluggable architecture. If my API is not very good, then it will get replaced by somebody else's API, right? So that's one aspect. The second aspect is, there is a difference between the provider and the client in terms of who, who owns the data. We strongly believe from IBM that client owns the data, so we will not go in and, and do anything crazy with it. Right? We won't even touch it. So we'll provide a framework and a cartridge that is like very industry specific. Like for example, if Watson has to act as a call center agent for a telco, we will provide a, a set of instructions that are applicable to telco, but all the learning that Watson does is on top of that client's data. We are not going to take it from one telco and put it in another telco. That will stay very local to, to that telco. And hopefully that is the way the rest of the industry develops too. That they don't take information from one and provide to another. Even on an anonymized basis, this is a really bad idea to take a, a client's data and then feed elsewhere, right? It has all kinds of ethical and moral consequences, even if it's legal. Absolutely. And we would encourage clients to take a look at some of the others out there and make sure that that's the arrangement Absolutely. they have. <laughs> that, what a great job for an analyst firm, right? But coming, to the, but I want to <laughs> yeah. build upon this point because I heard something very interesting in, in the keynote, uh, the CDO of IBM, um, in the keynote this morning. He, can't, he, he used a term that I've thought about but never heard before, trust as a service. Are you, are you guys familiar with his use of that term? Yep. Okay, what does trust as a service mean and <laughs> how, does it, how does it play out so that I, as, a, as a consumer of IBM cognitive services, I have a measurable difference in how I trust IBM's cognitive services versus somebody else. Some, some would call that blockchain. In fact, blockchain might is often be called trust as a service. Okay, and blockchain is probably the most uh, physical form of it that we can find at the moment, yeah. right? Uh, a distributed ledger where it's open to everybody but then no one transaction can be tapped by somebody else. Right. But if we extend that concept philosophically, it also includes a lot of the, the concept about identity. Identity, oh, yeah. right? I as a user today don't have an easy way to identify myself across systems. Like if I'm behind the firewall, I have one identity. If I'm outside the firewall, I have another identity. 
But if you look at the world tomorrow, where I have to deal with a zillion APIs, this concept of a consistent identity needs to pass through all of them. It's a very complicated and difficult concept, right, to, to implement. So that trust as a service, essentially the, the like blockchain, there needs to be an, an identity service that follows me around that is not restricted to an IBM system or an Oracle system or something. But at the end of the day, blockchain's a mechanism. Yes. Trust as a service yeah. sounds like it's a... It's a transparency, is yeah, what it is. It sounds the more like it's transparency, a, it's the a more It's a way trust. of doing business. Yes. Sure. So is, is, is IBM going to be a leader in defining what that means? Well, look, in all cases, IBM has, we have always struck, uh, what's the right word? Striven, strove, stro strove, whatever, it's strove. <laughs> I'll, I'll strove, take that anyway. Thank you. Uh, to be an, a leader in how we approach everything ethically. I mean, this is truly in our in our blood. I mean, we are here for our clients, and we aren't trying to just get them to give us all of their you know data and then go off and use it anywhere. You have to pay attention sometimes that what you're paying for is exactly what you're getting because people will try to do those things and you just need to have a partner that you trust in this. And I mean, I, I know it's self-serving to say, but I mean, we think about data ethics. We think about these things when we talk to our clients and that's one of the things that we try to bring to the table is that moral, ethical, you know, should you? Just because, just because you can, and we have, just so you know, walked away from, from deals that were very lucrative before. Right, right. Because we didn't feel it was the right thing to do. And we will always, I mean, I know it sounds self-serving, I don't know how, okay. you won't know until you deal with us, but but pay attention, buyer beware. It's just Courtney you know? from IBM, we know what side you're on. <laughs> just <laughs> <Courtney>. <laughs> Believe me, if I'm associated with it, it's, yeah. But, but, I, but you know, it's a great point, because the other kind of ethical thing that comes up a lot with data is, you know, do you have the ethical conversation before you collect that data and how you're going to be used? Exactly. But that's just today. You, you yeah. don't necessarily know what's going to, you know, what and how that might be used tomorrow. Well, in other countries. That's it's really tricky. Future proofing is a, a very interesting concept. For example, vast majority of our analytics conversation today is around structured, unstructured, you know, those kinds of terms. But where is the vast majority of data sitting today? It is in video and sound files, which... That's okay, even more scary. It is significantly <laughs> scary because the technology to get insights out of this is still developing. Right. So all these things like trust and identity and security and so on, like it need, and, and quantum computing for that matter, right? All these things need to think about the future where some arbitrary form of data can come hit you and all these principles of ethics and legality and all should apply. It's a very non-trivial challenge. Right. But I do see that some countries uh, you know, are starting to develop their own protections, like the general data protection regulation is going to be a In huge Europe, yeah. driver of and, forced ethics. And Sadly, some countries are not. And some countries, and some countries, are, countries not. are not. I mean, it's just like, Cognitive is just like anything else. When the car was developed, I'm sure people said, hey, everybody's going to go out killing people with their cars now, you right, know? Right. But it, it's the same thing. You can use it as a mode of transportation or you can do something evil with it. Yeah. It's, it's, it really is going to be governed by the societal norms that you live in as to how much you're going to get away with. And transparency is our friend. So the more transparent we can be, things like blockchain, other enablers like that that allow you to see what's going on and have multiple copies, the better. All right, well, Courtney, VJ, great topics. And that's why gatherings like this are so important to be with your peer group, you know, to talk about these exactly. much yep. deeper issues that are really kind of tangential to the technology, but really core to the bigger picture. So uh, keep, keep uh, getting out on the fringe to help us figure this stuff out. <laughs> I appreciate it, thanks right. for having thanks. me. Pleasure, all right, I'm Jeff Frick with Peter Burris. We're at Fisherman's Wharf in San Francisco, the IBM Chief Data Officer Strategy Summit 2017. Thanks for watching.